I'm Darlene Carmen, and welcome to the show. For most of us, dogs hold a special place in our hearts. Think about your favorite dog as you enjoy the show. He could have been a TV star, with the care and attention shown to the ones here. Maggie Pete is president and show chairman of the Santa Clara Valley Kennel Club. She will explain what's involved in dog competition and judging. Megan Hundley is a member of the Santa Clara Dog Training Club and will demonstrate some obedience exercises. Well, welcome. Too far away to shake hands, we'll just pretend there. <laughs> nice to have you. Um, before we get started, uh, maybe we should just um, see who you brought here, Maggie. Sure. Who's, who's, who do we have? So this is my dog, Charles. Um, he is a grand champion, uh, standard long-haired dachshund. He is almost five in September. Um, and he has actually competed worldwide. So wow. he is one here in America and also at the world's largest dog show in England. Wow. And Megan, you have a dog and we'll meet that dog a little bit later. So the Santa Clara Valley Kennel Club now just completed its uh, annual show mm -hmm. a little earlier this year. And so how has that show evolved during the 10 years that you've been involved? So um, I've been involved, like I said, about 10 years, but that show has actually been at the fairgrounds for almost 40 years. Mm. Um, and it's really just changed as dog shows as a sport have changed. So we have, at this point, we have confirmation. We also have performance events like obedience and rally that Megan's going to show some some demonstrations of that kind of thing. Um, we try and involve the public with demonstrations in the afternoon. Um, we've had different people come and do um, speeches or presentations as well. Um, but the main thing is it's an opportunity for the public to come and see what purebred dogs are available for them to see and what they do and watch the competitions um, and see dogs like Charles um, and talk to breeders like myself. I've actually been um, in dogs I'm, since I was born. My parents bred dogs before me, so I've been showing and breeding dogs my whole life. Um, and dog shows are like an extension of a family for those of us that compete. So mm. it's it, the, the changes are really just you know, who's involved and how it interacts, but really we're, the mainstay of it is just a place where you can see purebred dogs um, and meet people who love them. Mm. So a little bit more expansion there on your beginning, because you have been with purebred dogs all of your life. Yes. So a little bit more on your expansion on your beginning and also your success. Sure. So, um, like I said, I'm second generation. Um, I have been showing dachshunds since I was three. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually uh, competed at my first AKC event when I was five. Um, and <laughs> I bred my first champion when I was 14. Um, I have actually bred his great-grandfather, the only long haired dachshund to make it to Best in Show at Westminster Kennel Club, so the big dog show at Madison Square Garden. Huge. <laughs> yeah, very fun. Um, and then not only do I breed, but I show. So I've competed with Charles. Um, every show he's gone to, I show him at, and we actually flew all the way to England, like I mentioned before, to the world's largest dog show. There's 40,000 dogs that compete mm. at that show wow. over four days. Oh. Um, and there were approximately 4,000 hounds there, and he came in fourth best of wow. 4,000 hounds. Wow. So, and that's, that was quite the trip. So we fly into Europe and drive to England and go through this whole process of, of transporting a dog internationally. And so that was probably my biggest accomplishment in my mm -hmm. current do you, do you know what the winning trait was? What it, what clinched the deal? Do you know? So <laughs> that's part of when you're judging dogs at a dog show. It's comparing this dog or this the exhibit to a written standard. Mm -hmm. And that written standard is essentially a blueprint of what the dog should be. And okay. of course, no dog is perfect. Um, but for instance, the judge in England was just very thrilled. The main thing on dachshunds is form follows function. And that's really for any breed, form okay. follows function. So dachshunds are bred to go to ground, meaning they hunt uh, ground-dwelling vermin, 
down in a hole like a rabbit or a badger. Um, so his whole body function is based on needing to go down a hole, dig through dirt, <laughs> and grab something and, and kill it. Okay. So while he's very pretty to look at, <laughs> yeah. he also needs to, needs to have some skills. Um, none of those skills are really looked at at a dog show. But the purpose of the dog show is to try and assess the exhibits there to that standard, which is based on that function. Um, so the, the judge in England, for instance, said that he just had beautiful, what we would call type or the overall look of the dog, um, and then just his movement, so how well he's put together, his structure, his the angles of his shoulders and the angles of his hips. So. But he also has to walk around and yes. perform and stuff, right? Correct. Um, Correct. And you know, when you watch these judges, uh, they don't give anything away. <laughs> I mean, no you would poker never face. Know. Yeah, it's yeah. about a poker face. You would never know. <laughs> no. So your dog just goes through the moves. Uh, they're pretty much, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the main thing when it, when the judges first evaluating the dog, they'll come and take a look at the dog. Um, while they're standing in the ring, but then say a small dog, they'll go on a table, such as this, slightly taller, and the judge will examine the dog. So when he's examining this dog, he has a mental picture of that standard that he's learned and studied. So you're gonna start at the front, and this standard that we've talked about talks about all parts of this dog. Okay. So they're gonna talk about his, not just his head, but his teeth, how they're <laughs> supposed to be, and they will look at his teeth. <laughs> he has to show that. They look at the feet on how his feet are structured. They should actually be very tight like this, but the judge can actually look at all of those things. They will then examine and they're feeling the structure of the dog. They're feeling the bones and the hips and the ribbing. And then in the Dachshund Standard, it even talks about how the tail should come off, how the tail should be free of what we call kinks or any bends. Um, and then after this point, then they would have the dog move and they would look at the dog's movement, how this structure that is on the dog then correlates to its function and its form. Do they go around with a tape measure? They don't. they don't. So it should be in their, it should be in their in mind. Their mind. Wow. But for judges who, who judge frequently, um, there are some dogs that have, say, height recommendations. And a lot of judges will do like little cheater things, like they'll put a safety pin on the inside of their pant leg. No or they'll learn that the edge of their fingertips is a certain height so that oh, they can wow. get an idea of whether that dog is the height they should be or shouldn't be without essentially getting out what we would call actually a, a wicket or a measuring yeah. device. Yeah. Oh, that's so, kind of tricky. I doubt if most people catch that when they're... <laughs> no, it's the idea is to be subtle about it um, because really the you don't want to ever embarrass an exhibitor. Sure. Sure. Um, but it's their job, right, mm -hmm. as the judge, is to be interpreting that standard mm -hmm. and giving an objective mm -hmm. opinion of that dog. So now your dog is in the hound family. Yep. Bred for hunting. Correct. And your dog, Retriever, which we'll see a little bit, is for sporting. So what are the other breeds that are in the all breed? Sure. So there are seven groups. Yes. Um, and so we will start with a sporting group, which are Retrievers, Springers, Spaniels, Cockers, uh, setters, pointers, that's the sporting group. Uh -huh. Charles has a hound group. There are typically two types of hounds. There are sight hounds, which are like Afghans and greyhounds that hunt by sight, as the, the breed talks about, or scent hounds, which are the lo smaller dogs, beagles, bassets, dachshunds, mm. which hunt by mm -hmm. smell. Mm -hmm. So that's a hound group. Then you have the terrier group, which dachshunds are actually very closely related to them. Terriers are the dogs that our sole purpose is to go and kill something um, <laughs> in the ground, in a hole. So terriers Rats. range. I read Correct. that they're We Ratters. don't want to say this on the show, but you know, right. in the old days, I guess. Correct. <laughs> so, and they range in size from an Airedale, which is a very large dog, to a Norwich Terrier. Then you have toys, as we all know of the companion dogs. Um, Herding dogs, like a Corgi, a Collie, a Sheltie, German Shepherds, all the other Shepherds. Um, and then what we call the non-sporting group. In other parts of the world, it's called a utility group. Mm. Um, and those are breeds that, that have a function, but it's not a specific 
that would fit into that group. So like the bulldogs, um, the poodles, which are very over, all around dogs, um, Dalmatians, they still have a purpose, but it's hard to kind of pigeonhole them into that, into a specific group like the sporting dogs, right. the hounds. So, and toy, and yep. companions, so, we have companions. Yep, so those are companion dogs. So there are seven <laughs> groups. You have sporting, hound, terrier, toy, non-sporting, herding, and then the working dogs. And the, wor oh, the working okay. dogs, yes. So the Very working important. dogs are the largest Guards, dogs. And yeah. back in Rescue. the 80s, working dogs and herding dogs were all together in the yeah. same group. Yeah. So working dogs are the largest dogs, and then the smallest working dog is actually a standard schnauzer. So all of oh. the schnauzers, except a miniature schnauzer, are in the working group, but you have Akitas and Rottweilers and Dobermans are all in the it's working fascinating. group. Fascinating. It's so much, so much to know. <laughs> <laughs> now, Megan, talking about the uh, obedience competition, <clears throat> what are dogs required to do? We're going to see a demo in just a minute, but just to set us up on what are dogs required to do? Absolutely. So in obedience, there are three main levels of competition. There's what we call novice, or an entry level competition. There's open, which is the middle, and then there's utility, which is the most advanced. Okay. And all of the exercises build on the novice skills. So in novice, what you'll see is that the dog and handler work pretty closely together, and they show that they can work as a team. Okay. The primary exercise in novice is healing, where the handler walks and the dog stays in one position, regardless of whether the handler turns left or right or runs or slows down or stops. Okay. So that's mostly novice. And then open, what you'll notice the difference is the dog will heal off leash and they oh. will do retrieving exercises. Mm. So they'll have dumbbells, they'll do some jumping, and that encompasses most of the open exercises. Okay. And for utility, this is the most advanced dogs and, and where the, the real true fun starts to happen. They will do some retrieving, but instead of just going out and getting the one thing that you threw, They'll have to use their nose, like Maggie talked a little bit about before. They'll have to use their nose to discriminate against the one item of all the 12 out there that I touched, and they'll bring that one back to me. Let's, let's meet Gracie. Let's I meet can't Gracie. wait for this. So Gracie. Let's meet Gracie. <laughs> Gracie, do, 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 do. <laughs> so this is Gracie. Gracie is an almost two-year-old golden retriever, <clears throat> and she is in training. So we'll show you a little bit uh, today. What you'll notice in competitions is that you can't use food. So in the competitions oh. that Maggie does, with confirmation, you can use food. Oh. But in the obedience competitions or in rally competitions, you cannot. But for today's purposes, because this dog is in training, I, was just we have, I have a pocket full of cookies, <laughs> and we will be using cookies today. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> the other thing to notice about obedience competitions and rally and agility and hunting and tracking is that your dog does not have to be a purebred dog to do it. So although this dog is a purebred dog, the AKC has recently allowed dogs that are called all-American dogs to compete as well. Ah. So that's really fun. Okay. All right, so we'll, this is Gracie, and we'll start off with a little bit of healing okay. so that you can see what that, what that might look like. All right, you ready, Gracie? Do, do. Come on, you. Ready? Heal. Good girl. So as I move, she has to stay right with me. And then when I stop, she has to stop. Good. Heal. <laughs> And when I turn around, she comes with, oh, good girl, get it. Nice job. Good, 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 good. good. <laughs> There's not a lot of traction here. <laughs> but that is what the, the healing exercises look like. And the more advanced levels, they're off leash. And then in the final, most advanced level, you can't talk to your dog at all. It's all done by hand signals. Oh. So I'll show you a couple of hand signals that Gracie knows so far. Good job. Stay. So the first hand signal she knows is, my, if I raise my hand up, she lies down. We'll get her a cookie for that. Good job. And the next one she knows is sit. Good. And then her recall signal is like this. And she comes. Perfect. And you'll see how the dog is sitting perfectly straight to me, from her tail to her hips to her shoulders to her nose, comes straight up the middle of my body. Wow. And in obedience, you lose half points or full points. And so if the dog isn't perfectly straight, they can lose, lose points for that. Wow. And the goal of a competition <laughs> is to keep the 200 points that you walk into the ring with. It doesn't often happen. It's never happened for me and my other dog. We've gotten 199 of those points, but we've never gotten all, all 200 of them. Uh. So that's a little of the healing, and that's a real foundation exercise for anything that you'll do in obedience. But the second exercise we're going to show, Andrew's going to come help us with that, and this is the retrieving exercises. All right, here she is. She's all yours. 
<laughs> so Gracie is a hunting dog. She hunts pheasants and ducks. And one of the things that we do as we train our dogs is we use a replacement bird, which is called a bumper. And so Andrew's going to tell Gracie to stay and throw this bumper. Stay. Gracie, stay. And it happens in real life, too. Come, Gracie. Gracie, come. Good job. Sit. And hunting dogs are trained to retrieve the bird to hand, so she's not allowed to bring it back to him and drop it on the floor. She has to bring it and hold it in her mouth until he tells her to give it to him. Oh, oh, oh. So that's Sit. how we train for retrieving for field competitions. And then in obedience, thankfully, we don't use birds. We use something called a dumbbell. The only rules are that the dumbbell be made out of solid material and be appropriately sized for the dog. And so we're going to demonstrate that exercise with Gracie now. Stay. Ah. Take. Gracie, come. Take. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Gracie, come. Gracie, come. Sit. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> Yay, Gracie, come. Thank you very much, Andrew. <laughs> so those are the primary exercises for sit, stay, for the open exercises. There's one other piece we haven't talked about yet for for obedience competitions, which are called the group exercises. So in confirmation, groups are when all the, Maggie described the seven groups. For obedience, groups are what we call sits and downs. So the, in novice, the dogs must sit beside their handlers, sit, stay, and then they're all in a row. Every dog that competed in that class sits four feet from each other in the ring, all in a row. And the handlers sit, stay. Then the handlers take their leashes off and they leave the dogs and go to the other side of the ring uh -oh. for a minute. And you watch all the dogs sit where they're supposed to stay. And then it's a three minute down. And then in the open exercises, the handlers leave the ring. So it's a three minute out of sight sit and a five minute out of sight down. Wow. Gracie can't do those things for us yet. Uh, she's just learning. And I'm going to demonstrate a little bit about how we teach, how we teach dogs some of these tricks. Because I get asked that quite a lot. <clears throat> Here we go. So this is a bucket, and one of, the things, <laughs> one of the things that competition obedience dogs have to know how to do is how to move their body in a very specific way. So you can, <laughs> you can teach that any way you want. This is not my first dog. She, she's my second dog, and I taught the first dog. It was really boring how we did it. So this time we got more creative, and we taught the dog how to move on a bucket. So what Gracie knows is that she's supposed to stay on my by my side right <laughs> and she'll just turn and I teach this first and ultimately what I end up doing is teaching the dog so if I go this way she'll move her body to the right if I go this way she moves it to the left good job bark good job the other thing Gracie's learned how to do is to put her back feet on the bucket good <laughs> dog and again it's she's just learning how to move her body come this Aww, way that's cute good girl just learning how to move her body so that as she has to get her big self all perfectly lined up in front of me, she has more control over where that goes. So the first year of Gracie's life, all she did was pretty much play on the bucket. And I taught her to back up. Good girl. The other thing that that eventually transitions into, Gracie, look, is that she knows how to sidestep wow. in front of me to the left and to the right. Again, the whole purpose of that is to try to get her to learn how to come perfectly straight in front of me. I have a question. Sure. I, know she, I know she's not a horse, but I know that in horse training, backing up was always hard. So can, is that one of the, I don't want to say tricks, that's the wrong it's word. It's totally a trick. All of obedience <laughs> is a trick. You got it mm -hmm. right. Okay. With my Great Danes, backing up is really easy for them because mm. they're so big and my house is so small, mm -hmm. they can't turn around. Ah. <laughs> they get in these spots and they just have to learn how to back up. With my golden retrievers, has been one of the hardest things to teach mm -hmm. them because they're so athletic and they can turn in all these tight spaces. So how I taught Gracie to back up was I had her stand and I just would take a cookie in my hand and I would just gently push her backwards ah. and I'd take up her space. If I step ah. into her, she's going to back away from me. Ah. And then over time, what I taught her was I shake my hand back like this and step in her space and she learns how to back up. Ah. And it's, again, not a part of the formal competition exercises, but it's um, something that's really helpful for them to learn how to do. I have a ladder, a metal ladder I put down in my backyard, and my dogs will walk backwards through it without putting their feet on the metal part. Wow. All, again, just to teach them how to, to move their bodies. Mm. 
Perfect. So let's see. The other thing that Gracie does, there's something called rally, which, ra which is a whole bunch of sit, stay, exercises with little signs on the floor that give the handler a clue of what to do. And I'll demonstrate a few of those things for you as our last, uh, our last little intro. Okay. And for folks who think they may want to compete in AKC events, Rally is a great place to get started for, for obedience. Because of how often I pay the dog on the bucket, it's hard to get her off of it if I don't move it. <laughs> so check inside to see if there's so, anything yeah, in there. Just check the bucket. So one of the things Gracie, heel, that Gracie would have to do is to go around me in a circle. Sit. So that's an exercise. Another would be to go around me and walk a few steps. Down. And go down beside me. Ready? And then back up. Beep. 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 <laughs> beep. Get back. Beep. Get beep. Out the beep. Beep. Yeah. The last, I thought that was kind of appropriate. So that's a Gracie and my parting, uh, parting trick for today. And thanks for letting us be part of part of the show. I really, really enjoy that. Thank you. So Gracie's going to take Gracie. a walk with yes. Andrew Gracie's there. going to go off stage. Um, I wanted to ask you, I read something that you were writing about uh, learning. Is this how, it, what you demonstrate, is that how you teach a dog how to learn when you were writing that to me? Yeah. Is so, that? Yes. Dogs learn in, in two ways. There's classical conditioning, where we think about Pavlov and his ball, and operant conditioning. And I use both of those approaches as I teach my dog things. And there's 105 different ways to teach dogs tricks. What uh, I'm fundamentally lazy or busy, you could look at it either way. And what I try to figure out is, what is it that I want my dog to do? How can I break that, that task into really, really, really small pieces? And what is the simplest way to communicate that to the animal? And what I have found is that uh, operant conditioning works really, really well for most of the things that I do, and also using my body. Mm. So I don't often use a lot of words when I'm teaching the dogs to do something, because it's kind of like the Charlie Brown teacher, wah, 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 right? <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> but I, use a, I take up their space by stepping into them or by moving my body to the left or the right. That's how I taught her to spin her bottom on that disc was That's just cool. stepping to the left, and then she moves away from me mm. to try to, to get out of my space. Yeah. So it's just lots of trial and error to mm. figure out how to, how to get the dog to do what you're asking them to do. That's pretty neat because there's, I imagine, I think that what I'm hearing from both of you is that this is something, though, I know that you can have a handler, you can have the trainer be a handler, sure. and you could have uh, the owner or um, um, you could hire somebody. Sure. But... Isn't it most important to really have the, the owner of the dog participate? Isn't that, isn't that the most enjoyable for people to have the owner participate in either obedience or training for a dog show? Mm -hmm. So I'll talk on my sure. side. So um, in confirmation, you absolutely can own or handle your dog and do very well. Um, I am not a professional handler. There are people, as you said, who you can hire whose whole job, their entire career, is to show dogs. But as an owner, you can also do that. Um, and, and personally, I believe that that connection with your dog results in a better show of the dog. Mm. And you also can compete at specific levels. So at confirmation events, you can actually compete in an owner-handled series where there aren't, they cannot place the professional handlers. It's only a section of the, the show that's for owner handled. So it's definitely something that you can get directly involved in. Um, and we have people here at Santa Clara Valley Kennel Club. We would be happy to have them you know, contact us on the website and invite them to a show or a meeting and, and talk about it. And then Megan can talk about on the on the performance side too. Sure. It's very similar. You can do both. Do it yourself or hire some help. And I've done a little bit of both. I have to take lessons to learn how to do it. Yeah. And it's, for me, like Maggie said, it's, it's most enjoyable to get to develop a relationship with the animal. And I read in the newspaper, too, on the article you mm -hmm. were mentioned in there. And uh, it also talked about how you felt that the dog shows, all of this is family. Mm. Oh, yeah. And they're all over the world. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on that show that you had earlier in February, mm -hmm. you had people from, what, Hawaii? Oh, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have people from Hawaii, we have people from the East Coast, we had people from Washington, um, 
when I go to dog shows in New York City, you know, when you are watching the dog shows on TV, we just had the dog show um, in Beverly Hills, and there were dogs from all over the country there. But like I, I told you before, Darlene, I could probably travel almost anywhere in the world and pick up the phone or send an email and have someone that could help me if I was stuck. Wow. And that's that for me is, that's like family. I said, an extension yeah. of yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's like family. <laughs> that's, that's like, now, where could people go to see? I think it's really important. Uh, I know for me, uh, watching the agility, mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy that. That's just great fun. The dogs are having so much fun. And it's usually in the hot sun that you're watching. Yes, yes. <laughs> and and the dogs don't care. I mean, they're just having so much fun. So I think it's kind of important for people to actually be exposed and see some of these, either the dog shows or the agilities, uh, obedience. Um, do you have any shows that you can talk about, like coming up in June? June, say? There are some shows coming up in June. They're mostly confirmation and obedience in nature. Mm -hmm. Then there's shows also, the closest ones probably are the Carmel shows in the middle of July. Mm -hmm. Yes, those, I, I think, uh, actually I did, I think I wrote that down. Um, Vallejo. There are some There's Vallejo one in Vallejo uh, June 8th show. and 11th. Wolfstock. And mm -hmm. then there's, uh, in Carmel, there's one July 14th and 16th. Which online. website can people go to to find information where their dog shows coming about? Because I know yours is an annual show, so mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but we'll uh, see you all next February. Right. <laughs> well, uh, I did try to find a website that showed other... Uh, sure. So here's the magic. Here's where you do it. Yeah. You go to the AKC site, yes. and there's a tab called Events. Events. And under Event, there's an event calendar, and you can search by stage, you can search by event type, whether you want to see agility only in the hot sun, or if you want to go watch confirmation or obedience. Oh, so I, I just didn't there. carry it far enough. It's okay. <laughs> right. It's a little bit of a mystery. But that's so, where you can go. <laughs> so it's the American Kennel Club website, which is www.akc.org. Yes. But like Megan was talking about, the event section, as you were saying, you have confirmation events like we showed, or performance events like Megan showed you obedience and rally, but you also have agility. Um, you also have field trials, which is the, say, the retrieving, the yeah. retrievers working right. in the field with birds. Um, and if you come to a dog show, uh, at any of the ones you've mentioned in the future, we have lots of pamphlets and we can, typically there will be a tour at that show as well. So check well, out I the main desk. I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. And I'd like to tell people out there that they can find out more information by going on the akc.org website, which should be up for you. And you get information on, first of all, requirements, how to register. They have neat publications. Uh, this one here, Beginner's Guide to Dog Shows. Ooh pretty hefty so you can get a list of their publications. So thank you for watching the show and watch again.